everyone, my name's Abby Tipler and I'm one of the surgeons at Veterinary Specialist Services. Today we're going to be discussing one of my favourite topics, which is the pros and cons of desexing and the age to desex your pet. Uh, it's a little bit more complex than we once thought, and so I hope you enjoy the ins and outs of the desexing topic. And if you have any questions, then don't hesitate to give me a call. I'll chat with you soon and we'll get started. Okay, so desexing, pros, cons, and what age do we desex? So there's a lot of factors that we need to consider when it comes to desexing. Firstly, we've got our patient factors. So what's the temperament of the breed? Is the breed prone to certain types of neoplasia? And we'll have a look at this. What age are we considering to desex the patient? Is probably the final one. Then we've got our client factors. So our clients tend to be fairly educated. They've often been on the internet. They know about all the various options and they often have some degree of a previous bias. So um, their previous pet may have died under anaesthetic for removal of a splenic hemangiosarcoma, or it may have had debilitating orthopedic disease. So these are the sorts of things that we may also need to take into consideration. Then we have the, the scientific literature, and this is a very important factor, um, but we do need to remember that an association doesn't necessarily imply a causation. So desexing has a higher incidence of obesity, but is it the obesity that makes the dog more prone to some diseases, or is it the LH receptors in the cruciate ligament and bladder, etc.? And then finally, we have disease factors. So something like prostatic carcinoma holds a guarded prognosis, but it's rare, so the impact of this is less. So we'll take a look at the prevalence and the severity of various diseases as we go through. Then to further complicate things, there are a few options for the sterilization of pets, and your clients may be asking you about some of these new options. So we'll go through some of those um, a little bit later. And one thing to just never um, forget, I guess, is the there is an ethical consideration. So there's a lot of dogs that are euthanized in shelters each year, and reducing unplanned and indiscriminate breeding is obviously an effective means of population management. And non-compliance with Spain neuter contracts is as high as 60%, which is why shelters need to desex prior to rehoming. So an article I'll bring your attention to straight away is this open access article, um, which means that anyone can read it uh, online. You don't need a subscription to a, a certain journal. And it looks at a bunch of dog breeds and the prevalence of joint disorders, cancers, and urinary incontinence. And I can't underestimate the importance of looking at the, the breed related factors when it comes to decisions about desexing. Now, one of the things that these articles don't take into consideration is the benefits of desexing when it comes to population control and the reduced risk of trauma and infectious disease in the desex population. So it's all about pros and cons, and uh, we may, if we decide to, to desex a breed um, later to reduce the risk of cancer, um, then we may um, be increasing the risk of that, that dog running out and getting hit by a car or um, developing some form of infectious disease. So these are all of the things that need to be discussed with our, with our clients. There is a very good table in this paper, um, which gives a, a summary of the recommendations based on breed and um, which what age they recommend to, to desex based on breed when taking into account the factors that they studied. So let's just now break down some of the various diseases and whether or not the risk increases or decreases with desexing. So the first one we'll look at is mammary gland neoplasia. Now mammary gland neoplasia can account for 50 to 70% of all neoplasias in populations where there's large numbers of entire females. So it's prevalent and around 50 to 60% of them are malignant in dogs and 90% in cats. 
And the paper we're probably most familiar with is the one where bitches that are de-sexed prior to their first estrus have a 99.5% risk reduction. And after their first estrus, but before their second, a 92% risk reduction. And then if they're allowed to have more than two cycles, or if they're older than 2.5 years, then the, the effect is lost. And subsequent studies have um, continued to show a protective effect of desexing on mammary neoplasia. So a few other female neoplasias. So ovarian tumors are fairly rare. Uh, they occur at a low rate and they have a low rate of mortality. Uterine neoplasia is also quite rare. Um, obviously, ovarian hysterectomy and ovary sparing hysterectomy are protective and they occur at a, at a low rate and are often benign. Vaginal and vulval tumours also occur at a fairly low rate, with leiomyomas being the most common. And nothing's been absolutely proven, but um, ovarian hysterectomy may have a protective effect. And when it's used as an adjunct to surgical resection, it's generally almost curative. Transmissible venereal tumours are essentially a sexually transmitted disease. Therefore, intact dogs are at the greatest risk. And in regions where there's a lot of intact dogs, it can actually be the most common tumour, and METs occur in around 5 to 17% of cases. Testicular tumours are quite common, but metastases are rare. Castration is preventative and generally curative as well. And a cryptorchid testicle may be more prone to testicular neoplasia, and so cryptorchids should be castrated. Um, for this reason and also as we don't want them to be bred from as it's a heritable disease. Prostatic carcinoma is a, a nasty one. It's locally invasive with a high rate of METs, but the prevalence is reasonably low at around 03 to 0.6%. Castration increases the risk. There's around an eight times increased risk, but age of castration may not have an effect as the interval between castration and the onset of problems is quite variable. Transitional cell carcinomas account for around 2% of tumours, but they're also quite nasty ones with a high local metastatic rate. And desexing increases the risk by around 2 to 4%, and only 16% of patients survive uh, a year post-diagnosis. So lymphoma is a common neoplasia. Complete remission can be achieved in around 60 to 90% of affected dogs with chemo, and a good quality of life is generally achieved in these patients. One study found a two times increased risk in neutered dogs, but another study found no difference. So mast cell tumors, there was a four times increased risk in spay females in one study, but then again, risk varies by breed. And there's an increased risk for breeds such as D6 Vizslas, but there was no increased risk in, in Golden Retrievers, Labrador Retrievers, or German Shepherds. So again, it highlights the importance of breed when it comes to assessing the risk for the various neoplasias. Hemangiosarcoma represents around 5 to 7% of all non-cutaneous neoplasia, and the prognosis is poor, with only 10% surviving 12 months, even with surgery and chemotherapy. D6 females had a twice increased risk in one study. There is also a risk specifically for cardiac hemangiosarcoma in D6 dogs, but this is fairly rare at 0.19%. Again, there's breed differences, and these always need to be considered. Osteosarcoma is the most common primary malignant bone tumor. It's locally aggressive and frequently has early mets, most often to the lungs. Around 90% of patients die of metastatic disease within a year when amputation is the only treatment. It's more prominent in larger breeds and desexing increases the risk by around twofold. Risk may be reduced if desex greater than one year of age. Rottweilers are a bit of a special group. Around 25% of neutered Rottweilers develop osteosarcomas. And in one study, the earlier you neutered them, the higher the risk. Um, however, Rottweilers are also prone to, to joint disorders, so desexing later in Rottweilers is, is probably recommended. So let's just quickly talk about the risk of neoplasia in mixed breed dogs. So there was another article published out of the, the same journal. It's also open access and the link to that is on the screen. And, um, and this basically looked at the risk of neoplasia in 
uh, mixed breed dogs. And what it basically found is that in no weight category was the risk of neoplasia increased with desexing in the mixed breed population. And the cancers that they looked at in this study were lymphoma, mast cell tumor, hemangiosarcoma, and osteosarcoma. So the summary of all of this when it comes to neoplasia is that some pure breeds have an increased risk of cancer when they're desexed, and especially when they're desexed at a younger age. Um, but mixed breed dogs appear to not have an increased risk of most of the cancers, just generally speaking. So now let's look at orthopedic disease. And there's been a number of various breed specific studies. And the very generalized finding is that for some breeds, when they're desexed before skeletal maturity, their risk of joint disease is increased. And this finding is not always consistent um, across the sexes. So a few examples of patients with an increased risk of orthopedic disease are golden retrievers, Labrador retrievers, German shepherds, Rottweilers, male beagles, and female Australian cattle dogs. And this is evidence that for these particular patients, we may need to consider desexing at skeletal maturity. And then in other breeds, no increased risk has been proven as yet. So for example, boxers, border collies, great danes, and pugs. So let's just look at cruciate ligament disease. So two to 4% of dogs get cruciate ligament disease and it's more common in the larger breeds. And there's lots of factors involved in this very complex disease as we know, and it's difficult to sort of tease these out sometimes. But neutered dogs have a significantly higher prevalence of cruciate ligament disease in some breeds. So in terms of hip dysplasia, the evidence surrounding hip dysplasia varies and some studies look at joint disease prevalence as a whole versus assessing hip dysplasia individually. However, one study found that golden retrievers have an increased risk in males desexed prior to one year of age, and boxers desexed at least six months prior to their hip dysplasia diagnosis were 1.5 times more likely to develop hip dysplasia. And this paper looking at the mixed breeds also looked at the risk of orthopedic disease. And in summary, the mixed breed dogs greater than 20 kilograms have an increased risk of joint disease when they're desexed. So a summary, I guess, of desexing when it comes to orthopedic disease is that some breeds of dogs and mixed breeds greater than 20 kilos have an increased risk of joint disease and we should consider desexing them, those groups at skeletal maturity. In terms of behavior, the effects of behavior are quite mixed. The pros of desexing are that there is a reduction in roaming, hormonal interdog aggression, and urine marking. The most serious bite injuries usually involve sexually intact dogs. Intact males and females were significantly more likely to be referred for aggression and reactivity. In terms of the cons of desexing, however, there's an increased dominance aggression towards family members in females and in puppies that had already showed signs of aggression. This risk reduced the older they were desexed. In terms of age to desex, in one study they compared groups desexed prior to around six months versus post six months of age. And those desexed early were more likely to display noise phobias and sexual behaviors, and males were more likely to show aggression towards family members and bark at visitors. But the post six months group were more likely to develop separation anxiety, urination due to fear and escape behavior. And in a further study, however, there was no difference before and after the six month mark in these behaviors. So again, the literature is a little bit mixed when it comes to behavior. In terms of other medical implications, castration does reduce androgen-related diseases, so benign prosthetic hyperplasia, chronic prostatitis, perianal adenomas, and perianal hernias. And this is important as benign prosthetic hyperplasia affects around 50% of intact dogs by five years of age and 95% by nine years of age. And these dogs are prone to prostatic cysts, prostatitis, and prosthetic abscesses. So castration is the recommended prevention and treatment for benign prosthetic hyperplasia. 
So for females, ovaria hysterectomy and ovaria sparing hysterectomy prevent and treat pyometra, metritis, as well as other problems associated with pregnancy and parturition. And it's important to note that if you perform an ovary sparing hysterectomy or an ovary sparing spay, that you remove the entire uterus to avoid these problems. The incidence of pyometra in intact dogs varies by breed, but can be up to 25% by 10 years of age. And medically managed pyometra has a recurrence rate between 20 and 70%, so medical management can't be recommended for this. Pyometra can result in septic shock and renal failure, and mortality rates are between 4 and 17%. So urinary incontinence, it affects around 2 to 20% of de-sexed females, mainly the larger breeds. And those de-sexed before three months of age appear to have the highest risk. And de-sexing at six months versus after the first heat does not appear to increase the risk as once proposed. In a German Shepherd study, however, it was found that German Shepherds de-sexed after 12 months of age had no increased risk of urinary incontinence. So therefore, this may complicate recommendations in respect to German Shepherds. But in terms of urinary incontinence, a lot of patients will respond to medical management, but we know desexing increases the risk. In terms of urinary incontinence risk for mixed breeds, the trend was towards later desexing, reducing the risk of urinary incontinence. However, Overall, we know that desexing increases the risk of urinary incontinence in general. So there are a few other important medical considerations. There's an increased risk of obesity in desex dogs due to increased appetite and slowed metabolism. There's a reduced risk of perianal fistulas in males and females who are desexed. In terms of overall lifespan, in a large study, they found that overall, there is an increased lifespan in D6 dogs. Now in females, lifespan was increased by 26% and in males, 14%. In the D6 population, there was an increased risk of death by neoplasia, but a decreased risk of death by trauma and infectious disease. So intact dogs were found to be twice as likely to get hit by a car or bitten by another animal. So I'm just going to briefly touch on cats. Uh, so there are a few cons to desexing. It increases their risk of feline lower urinary tract disease and diabetes, um, although these may be obesity related. It increases their risk of capital physeal fractures, but it decreases their risk of mammary neoplasia and their risk of pyometra. But ultimately in cats, uh, desexing decreases the risk of spraying inside and into animal aggression and probably given these behaviours are poorly tolerated by owners that probably gives us our answer for our pet cat population. Um, so pet cats my recommendation would be to, to desex them at around six months of age. So in terms of the options for desexing, we're just going to touch on these now. There's been a little bit um, of interest in some of these newer procedures, um, especially from clients who are, are getting on social media and reading up about them. So ovaria hysterectomy is the traditional approach that we all know about. Ovariectomy is very similar to ovaria hysterectomy. So you keep the uterus, um, but because you remove the hormonal effect on the uterus, you can't get a pyometra, um, or etc. So it's essentially a very similar procedure to an ovaria hysterectomy with a very similar rate of complications. Then we have a procedure called an ovary sparing hysterectomy. Now, this is the one where there's a bit of discussion about it online. So it renders the dog sterile but your hormones are maintained and you can leave one or both ovaries. The dog continues to have a heat cycle and there may be a small amount of bloody discharge and they will be attractive to male dogs. And they'll also have the behavioral side effects of being on heat, such as yowling, etc. Now, theoretically, they're not meant to be able to get a pyometra, but if you leave any of the uterine stump at all, then you can get a stump pyometra. 
So for this procedure, you need to aim to remove the uterus beyond the cervix. Now, the procedure does seem promising. You spare the hormones. You have the bonus of not being able to get a pyo and you minimize um, the, the bloody discharge that's associated with heat. But the problem with it is that there's nothing much really reported in the literature at this stage. So we could get unanticipated complications that we that we don't know about yet. Um, and for example, I was speaking to one of the reproduction experts in preparation for this talk, and he was concerned that maybe these dogs could, could mate and that the trauma of, of the mating could perforate the stump and you could get a sperm peritonitis. Now, will this happen? We don't know, we don't have the data. So I think we need to warn clients that there may be unanticipated complications. And then, uh, for females, there is a tubal ligation and a tubal ligation in, in every way this dog is intact. It just can't become pregnant. Then for males, in terms of the surgical options, we've got traditional castration, which removes the hormones, or vasectomy, which pr preserves the hormones. So again, that dog is in any, every other way an entire male, uh, but it just can't um, impregnate a female. So what's the conclusion? Well, I believe that the conclusion is dependent on your client base, the prevalence of disease in your area, and what is feasible for your practice. And the most important thing perhaps is that we give the information to owners to help them make a decision that they feel comfortable with. So when pets are diagnosed with illness, it's common for owners to get online and do their own research. And you don't want them coming back to you saying, I, I really wish I'd known that D6 dogs are more prone to hemangiosarcoma because now my last three dogs have died from this. Or I, I wish I'd known that D6ing my dog would have reduced the risk of them being hit by a car. And it's not always possible to have these sorts of in-depth discussions with every client. And so my strong recommendation is to have a handout in your practices that you can give to your clients, which gives them a summary of the information and a link to some of the articles that we've spoken about. And I've made a handout, which I'm more than happy for practices to use, and we're more than happy to email this out to you. So, so please let us know if you'd like a copy. I think the take home messages are that Pyometra Unwanted pregnancies and mammary neoplasia are more prevalent in populations of entire dogs. They provide an unexpected and possibly high expense to dog owners. And there is also a high rate of euthanasias in shelters. Secondly, hormones do seem to have a protective effect on painful orthopedic disease in some pure breed dogs and mixed breeds greater than 20 kilos. Neoplasia in some dog breeds urinary incontinence and obesity. So desexing should be delayed until skeletal maturity around a year of age um, in our at-risk breeds. Or alternatively, we could consider one of those hormone sparing procedures and they can be performed at a younger age. And then finally, ovary sparing hysterectomy and vasectomy Render a dog infertile whilst preserving the effect of potentially protective hormones. Ovary, ovary sparing hysterectomy has not be, been widely studied and therefore unanticipated complications may occur. And again, please feel free to contact us with any questions or if you would like any information from this talk, we're more than happy to email it through to you. Thank you very much for listening.